Good, ev good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second of our new series of Wednesday Armchair Talks. This evening, it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Geraldine Morin, one, to, one of our own members, and also one of the people who's kept this group afloat with organizing talks and giving talks and doing lots and lots of things during the pandemic. Uh, so I just could not be more pleased to invite, to have her speaking tonight. Uh, Jer has been a tour guide in St. Patrick's Cathedral for 15 years. And as she puts it, she knows where the bodies are buried and she's going to give us a wonderful talk tonight. So please pay rapt attention and learn. <laughs> Jer, give me two seconds. I need to unmute you. There you go. That's me. There we go. Great. Hello, everybody. And you're all very welcome to this talk. I've given it so many times now, both in person and online, that uh, I'm, I'm, you're probably tired listening to it, but you're, maybe some of you haven't heard it already. So these are two, I keep calling them photographs. They're obviously not photographs. They're, they're, they're pictures, they're, they're drawings of some sort. These are two pictures of the cathedral, two very old ones. And if you look carefully at them, um, you'll see on the one on the, the colored one on the left-hand side, you'll see the buildings to the right and the left of the cathedral. They're the old tenement buildings. They were there um, before the ivy building. So this, this um, picture drawing dates from around I'd say the, the, the Ivy buildings went up in the 1880s, so it's pre that. And the one on the, uh, the, the black and white picture on the right hand side, uh, apart from your man herding his cattle up at Patrick Street, which didn't happen today or yesterday. Again, you see the old tenement buildings cheek by jowl with the cathedral. The right up against it, there's no park. There. There's no St. Patrick's Park and the Ivy buildings haven't been constructed yet. And something else you can see. And um, there where the, your man is, is leaning up against the wall on the, the extreme um, right of that picture. You, you might you mightn't be able to make it out. But the name, the street name is called Cross Puddle, Cross Puddle Lane. And that tells us that the puddle, the river puddle, the underground river of Dublin is actually flowing underneath the cathedral. So don't ask me why they decided in the 1200s when they when they built this cathedral, why they decided to build it on top of a river. Uh, but they did. I, I don't know why they had the engineers thought it would be a, a good idea to build a, con a constructed cathedral on top of a river. But they actually did. The, the puddle flows underneath the cathedral, goes on up to the castle and eventually into the River Liffey. And it's still there today. So you might have noticed during the pandemic, I don't know if you're in town, that the cathedral was shrouded in um, scaffolding for about two years. They had intended that they started work to replace the roof uh, just pre-COVID, a couple of a year before COVID. And they had intended to keep the cathedral open for visitors to, for, to, to generate revenue. But because of the lockdown anyway, they were able to close it, and which meant that the works were speeded up really fast. They were, um, they were able to complete them in two years. So the whole place is spanking new now, and it looks really well inside. Um, and I'll talk more about that, um, that later on. So this cathedral, it dates from the 1200s, the early 1200s. It was one of the first things that the Anglo-Normans built when they got to Ireland. And the reason that there's two massive cathedrals, people often say, why is there two huge cathedrals within a mile of each other? It's actually because the St. Patrick's is built outside the city walls. The walls were constructed in the 1200s. And when the Anglos arrived, they thought that Christchurch at the top of the hill was a little bit too, if you can imagine, a Viking, Celtic, uh, pagan, Christian person. They thought that the, the, that, um, the, the cathedral of Christchurch was just too um, Celtic Christian for them. And the Anglos wanted to go back to the old um, Anglo uh, Roman church. So that's why they built Patrick's at the bottom of the hill. He was outside the, um, the, the walls of the, the city. So therefore it didn't fall under the jurisdiction of the walls of the city. So that's why uh, of, the, of the city itself. So that's why there's two huge cathedrals together. And of course, when they built it, um, they it was built as a Catholic church. That was the only Christian faith at the time. But then, of course, and Henry VIII. And now when I'm bringing visitors around, you know, non-Irish people, I have to explain to them who Henry VIII was and what he did. But we all know that Henry VIII started the Anglican faith. 
So he took all the, the obviously he took all the, the in the in both islands, he, took, he confiscated all the church property to make it um, make them Protestant. They had the choice of being burnt to the ground or, as we say, in, in the north of Ireland, turning Protestant. And that's what happened. So um, the, the, all of these churches went Protestant at that time. So everything inside the cathedral is um, post-Reformation. There's no statues of saints. The, the, the river puddle, the water underneath, is the only water in the cathedral. There's no holy water fonts, nothing like that. All that stuff was destroyed at the time of the Reformation. So everything you're looking at is of secular men the, and they're nearly to 100 percent of men. It wasn't the done thing to venerate a woman in a church like this. So there's loads of statues of rich and important men. And anyway, there was no such thing as a rich and important woman in those days. So there's no statues of women or very, very few. But as, as uh, Beverly was saying, I'm, I'm, um, I know where all the bodies are buried because on account of the river, the puddle underneath, there's no crypts in this church. If you've ever been to Christchurch, there's a huge crypt, you know, a huge basement. It was all the medieval cathedrals had a, had a crypt for where they buried their dead. Well, there's none in St. Patrick's on account of the river. They kept flooding. So there's no crypts there. So they had to bury the bodies quite shallowly in the walls and in the floors. And they keep finding the bodies that they didn't know were there. So I'll, 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 um, I've made a, uh, make a point of bringing you to one or two of those as well. So it's a very, um, very interesting place, very exciting place. And the entire history of Ireland, when I'm bringing visitors there, I said, you're not coming to look at a dusty, musty old church, you know, that's 800 years old. You're, you're, you're going to look at every facet of history, not only religious, but the, the monuments inside tell every facet of Irish history, the political, the economic, the religious, the, um, the social history of Ireland are all found in the monuments inside. So that's the first slide. I've, I've spoken for 10 minutes on the first slide. I better keep moving. We'll be here all night. So that's an old um, picture of the, um, the nave, really before it became, um, if you like, a tourist attraction. It's very austere, very Protestant looking, as, as we would say in Ireland. Now, it's important to remember that St. Patrick's is not a, only a tourist attraction. It's actually a working church. There's two services here every day. There's morning prayer, um, 11 o'clock every morning. And there's the, the, um, the service of even song, which is um, the, the, a Protestant service of singing half past five every evening. And again, I'll talk more about that. Now, visitors are stunned when I tell them St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin is not a Catholic church. They just can't believe it. But uh, as I say, there's no um, there's no statues of saints. There's no um, no holy water fonts. And it, uh, since the 1500s, it has been a Protestant church. And again, visitors don't understand, they sometimes don't understand. They say, well, why didn't they change the name then? Why is it still called St. Patrick? But uh, Protestants have saints. They just don't have statues of saints in their churches. So that's a very old photograph of the, um, of the, uh, the nave before, if you like, it became um, a more, more of a tourist attraction. And again, Patrick's Cathedral is on, the, um, is on the route for every tour nearly that comes to Dublin. You know, you go to Trinity, you go to St. Patrick's, they're, they're just on the, on the tour. So as I was saying, the, um, the, they're all rich and important men. There's a whole line, I call them my marble men. As soon as you go in the door, you see them opposite uh, the doorway there. There's a whole line, about 10 statues of, of uh, men, uh, marble men. They're all, oh, some of them, they're archbishops and judges and, uh, you know, lord lieutenants and whatever um, during colonial times. They, they, had, they had the money to buy themselves a nice statue in the cathedral. And my favourite one, I won't go into them all, I'll be here all night, but they, my favourite one is this lovely one here. That's the Duke of Buckingham. And I like it because the statue has loads of lovely beading on his shirt. It's very detailed. It has, you can see the tassels on his belt, the buckles on his shoes. And this, as I say, is the, is the Duke of Buckingham. He was the first Grand Master of the Knights of St. Patrick. And that was an order of chivalry given by the British Crown to the Irish nobility, the Irish gentry. Uh, you had to be a man, obviously, to be a knight. And for a long time, you had to also be a Protestant although I believe a few Catholics uh, snuck in um, towards the end. But they, uh, the order is now disbanded since we got independence. But it was a big thing to be a Knight of St. Patrick. You got to put KP after your name. And it's similar to the Knight of the Thistle or the Knight of the Garter that they still have going um, in, the, in, the, in England at the time uh, uh, nowadays. Um, and as I say, the order was disbanded. But they used to have their inaugurations in the cathedral because of the, the connection with St. Patrick or the perceived connection with St. Patrick. I'll move on another little bit. So the, 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 um, the church obviously is built in a cruciform shape, you know, like a cross with cross arms and the top of the cross, the arms of the cross. So if you go through the nave and you go right over to the, um, the left-hand side, it's my favourite part of the cathedral because there's so much to talk about. 
They call it, it's, it's the, as I say, it's the left hand side of the cross arm. It's just in front of the choir area, the altar area. And it's, uh, I call it the, the military wing of the cathedral. And the first thing you do, you see when you're, you're here is British flags, the Union Jack. They're all over there. There's about um, several dozen of them and they're hanging from the top ceiling there of the cathedral. And they're in various stages of disrepair. But there, there are about a dozen of them and they're original flags from the Irish regiments that fought in the British army. Because over the years of colonialism, we didn't have an Irish army. So as you know, Irish fellas joined various regiments in the British army and they fought in all the big wars that England was involved in. Uh, for instance, they fought in Trafalgar, Waterloo, the Boer War, the China War, all those big wars that England was involved in all through the 70, 17 and 1800s and they um, in Irish regiments. And these are the original flags that they carried into battle. If you ever saw an old movie of those of those battles, it was always a poor Egypt walking in front. He was generally a child, a teenager. He was walking in front of all the lines of men behind him, the marching soldiers, and he carried the regimental flag. And it was in great honour, the great honour to hold the flag aloft. And in the British Army, the, the tradition there, it's a lovely tradition, actually. Um, it's like the, the phrase, old soldiers never die, they only fade away. So the flags are hung in a church. They um, the, all over England and obviously here in Ireland and in St. Patrick's, they hang in a church until such time as they deteriorate and disintegrate. And I've in the years since I've been there, I can notice the flags are getting blacker and blacker. The oldest flag is about um, it comes from the 1850s and the flags get blacker and blacker. They curl up and eventually they turn black. They, they almost look like uh, they go on fire. Or, you know, they don't go on fire. It looks like they've been burnt and the pieces drop on the ground. And security or the cleaners or the staff find them. I'd love to find a fragment. I, I cheerfully admit I'd steal it. But they um, they fall in the ground and they're, they're, then they're, um, they don't know what regiment it comes from. And that's the whole idea of it. The, the regiment is gone. It's finished. So you don't know what the, the, the flag is. In other words, the flag is gone. But it's a, I think it's a lovely um, tradition in the, in the cathedral. And some of the, um, in the army, in, in, the US, in the US army, the, I've been told that they burn the flag when the regiment is finished, but in the in the British Army, they hang it in a church. And some of the old regiments that Irish fellas um, fought in, um, I, I, I've just looked, so some of them are commemorated here in this section. And apart from the, we, we all know the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, uh, those ones, but there, there's, um, uh, there's amazing names of some of them. There's the Prince of Wales' own Irish regiment. There's the South Irish Horse, the Royal County Down, uh, and the North Tipperary Militia, loads and loads of regiments, and they're all um, commemorated in that part of the uh, that part of the cathedral. And also there are some lovely um, books, the, and these are the war dead of the First World War that I died, uh, Irishmen that died, both from North and South. Of course, it was, it was all the one island at that time in, in 1914 to 18. Um, the, it lists all the men who um, died, about the 50,000 men who died in the First World War. And it's amazing um, how you can see lists and lists. They're, they're in alphabetical uh, names by their by their surname, and you can see lists and lists of the same name. And actually, there's a house in Pat, there's a family in Patrick Street just up the road from the cathedral that lost three sons in the First World War. Can you imagine that? It wouldn't happen today, but in those days they were all recruited. They, you know, the army would have gone into a village or a whole street and recruited all the men from that same street, and they were all in the same regiment. So when they hit um, a conflict, they all perished in practically the same day. So uh, three three uh, sons from the same family. Imagine in, in, in a, just up the road. Uh, they, those books are on display in the in that corner just underneath the flags and they're um, designed they're um, decorated by uh, by Harry Clark so that's I have to say that's my favorite part of the cathedral there's some lovely stone um Irish wolfhounds you know the the Irish wolfhounds and they're part of um, um, a grave that's there also so we'll go on to the next one I will have time for questions afterwards now I want to show you my favorite monument in the cathedral, the, 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 where the flags are, the military wing is my favorite section, but this is my favorite monument. And as soon as you go in the door of the cathedral, you know, where at the cash desk there, and you take an immediate left, you'll see this monument. A lot of people just pass it by because the nave is to your right and they, you know, they look towards the nave and they, they head off and, and they miss the best monument in the entire place. It's a huge monument, it's floor to ceiling in height. So you can imagine the height of the cathedral. So it's, it's floor to ceiling in height, and it consists of a number of about, there's about 20 statues like this all along it, um, at, 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 from eye level right up to the ceiling. And it was bought and paid for by this fella here, 
That's Richard Boyle, B-O-Y-L-E. And the whole monument is called the Boyle Monument. And as I was saying earlier, um, the, the, the monuments tell the, the so many facets of history. Well, every bit of history is here, social, economic and political, in this monument. It's the biggest one in the cathedral and it's probably the most expensive. And um, because the invoice still exists for it, it was bought and paid for by this guy, Richard Boyle. And he was an Englishman. He was sent over to Ireland as a political appointee by Queen Elizabeth I in the late 1500s. And Richard, do you, do you ever hear your mother saying, oh, he married very well? You know, your mother would say that in but this note of envy. He married really well. But well, Richard had the good fortune to marry well, not once, but twice. How, how lucky can some guys be? He married a lady called Joan. This isn't her. This is the second wife. He married a lady called Joan. And she came as a dowry, hundreds of acres of land all along the south coast of Ireland in, in Cork, Kerry area. And then she promptly died within a couple of years of the wedding and left him the whole lot. So then he married this lady. She's Catherine, Catherine Fenton. She came with even more land. You had to come. A wife had to come with, with land and or dowry in those days. You wouldn't be you wouldn't be married otherwise. She came with hundreds of acres of land along Cork, Waterford. So there you are. Richard had big job, loads of money, loads of land. And Catherine, she stuck around long enough to also give him 15 children. And God bless her. She died for some reason. She died on her 15th childbirth. Imagine she was pregnant for about 11 years of her life. She died on her 15th childbirth. And Richard at this stage was the Earl of Cork. He had the, he was one of the richest men in, uh, in Ireland at this stage. He was the Earl of Cork. He was so powerful and rich that he had Catherine buried. She died in 1631. He had her buried under the main altar in the cathedral, in, in St. Patrick's Cathedral. And she's still there today. She's there with several of her relatives right under the main altar. And this huge big monument was her headstone, like you would put on top of a grave today. Now, it has been eventually moved. It was actually plunked in the middle of the cathedral on top of the altar, but it was eventually moved down to where it is today, um, down to the very end of the, uh, of the cathedral. But she's, her body is still under the, uh, the, the altar. And the invoice still exists for it, because when Catherine died in 1631, Richard paid £300 for this. So that's a fortune in today's money. You're looking at a million in today's money. So you can see how appreciative he was of her. There's himself. That's Richard himself. Picture of Richard. And there's Catherine, Catherine Fenton. Now, as I said, they had 15, um, 15 children. But um, as funny enough, as Richard was, um, it serves him right, actually. Richard was, was twice lucky in life with his, with his uh, dowries. But he was unlucky in death because when he died, he died down in Cork. And they couldn't bring his body all the way back to Dublin. Like he died in the early 1600s, shortly after Catherine. He couldn't, uh, they couldn't bring his body all the way back to Dublin because it would have been a bit ripe. So um, God bless him. After paying all that big money, the mega bucks for the nice monument, he's not buried in the cathedral at all. He's, uh, he's down in Cork. So um, uh, just a little bit about the, um, the famous person of the Boyles, because at eye level of the monument, down underneath where Richard and Catherine are, you'll see this, the monument here, these are some of their 15 children. You can see there it's written, the issue of the right honorable Richard Lord Boyle, Earl of Cork, the issue in those days, of course, were your children, your children were your issue. And this little one in the middle, the tiny child, if you like, in the middle, is their 14th child, their youngest son, and that's Robert Boyle. And he is the father of modern chemistry. And when I say that to Americans, they say, you're not serious. Robert Boyle is born in Ireland. Really? We, we never knew that. But he was. We, we became him anyway. He was born in Ireland. He was their, their youngest son of Catherine and uh, Richard Boyle. Born in Lismore, down in Waterford. That was their family um, pad, if you like, their country home. Um, now, Richard, um, Robert, rather, the child, being, um, he, he was the 14th one, so he was only a child, an infant, when his mother died. She died having the next one. Um, so he was only an infant. And being a rich Protestant boy, he was sent to England for his education. So he never really came back to Ireland. He went to Harrow and Eton and Oxford and all those nice places in England. And he studied chemistry. Uh, he never he didn't really come back to live in Ireland when he graduated from college. He went to live with his older sister. She was also Catherine. She's one of these people here along the, the bottom. They don't say which one it is. She's one of these, possibly that one. But Catherine is called after the, her, their, their mother. She was a good deal older than him. She might have been 10 to 15 years older than him. And she she also had married well. It must run in the family. She had married a rich English guy and she had a nice big house in London. 
So Robert went to live with her when he graduated college. And Catherine had um, an, a fascination with um, science and, and uh, what Robert had studied. But she was a woman in those days. I'm, I'm talking now in the 1650s, 60s. She had no hope of going to college. And women, why would you? Why would a woman want to go to college? So she couldn't go to college. But um, when Robert came to live with her, they built a laboratory in her house. And Robert carried out, they lived together for years, for the, for the next 30 years, they lived together in that house in London. And Robert carried out all his experiments and his investigations in that laboratory. And Catherine helped him. So she was not only a financial support, she was actually a physical support for him. And he probably would never got as, as far as he did if it wasn't for Catherine. But being, and uh, as we say, behind every great man, there's a great woman. That's why I like to talk about her, because Robert's name is gone down in history. Um, if, you're, if you study chemistry today, you'll study Boyle's Law. And that's Robert Boyle's law you're studying. And um, that law now, it's been explained to me a dozen times. I don't get it. I, I never did chemistry in school. So I'm afraid it means nothing to me. But it's something to do with the inversion of gas and air. They would actually use the basis of Robert Boyle's law um, in the manufacture of diving equipment, even in the manufacture of submarines. You know, they, they have to use the basis of that law. So Robert's name is, is famous. But Catherine's name is lost to history, even though she was his greatest support. So I like to give her a shout out. Now, if I was leading a group of Americans around, I wouldn't go into all those details. But because you're all sitting in your nice warm armchairs, I can do all that. You're not standing up uh, listening to me. So there's a picture of Robert himself. That's Robert Boyle. And I, that's his sister, Catherine. So it's nice to think that uh, we have to remember her, as I say, behind every great man, there's a woman. And the two of them actually lived, they live, as I say, they lived together for 30 years in that house and they died to, almost together. Um, I think Catherine died first. She died around Christmas Day or the day after Christmas Day. And Robert died before the new year. They died within days of each other. But they're both married. They're both uh, buried in, uh, in London. They're not buried here, um, uh, here at all. So that's my favourite monument in the whole place, because, as I say, it gives you so much of a flavour of, of all the stuff in, uh, in history. But this man I met, he's one of my marble men. I showed you the, the picture of them earlier and I was saying they were all rich and important men. Well, this guy is not rich and important. He was a hero and uh, he's in the cathedral also. He's a member of that line of, of marble statues. And Robert McNeil, or Captain, rather, Captain McNeil Boyle was born in Derry in the north of Ireland in the early 1800s. And he ran away to join the Royal Navy at the age of 13. And he must have been clever because he very quickly rose through the ranks and he was a ship's captain by the age of 40. And eventually got the job. He was sent back to Ireland. Then he got the job as being chief of the Irish Coast Guard. And he was based in what they call Irish Town, or Kingstown, um, present day John Leary. He was based there as, as a member, as, as the head of the Irish Coast Guard. And if you've ever um, walked down the East Pier in John Leary, you'll have seen a, mon um, a plaque on the wall for the on the East Pier for this for this man, because in 1861, there was a huge storm along the east coast of Ireland. Uh, there was there was dozens of people lost um, and a lot of them were um, lost around the present day John Leary because the ships, several ships were trying to get to the safety of uh, the harbour. And a couple of them ran aground against the walls. And because um, McNeil Boyd was the uh, the head of the Coast Guard, he was attempting to, to pull people out of the water and whatnot in his role as, as that. Um, and he drowned himself. And there was about 40 townspeople lost and, uh, and, and people from the ships. And they gathered the bodies and um, the bodies that they were able to, to gather. And they, buried, they had a mass funeral for them in, um, in Carrick Brennan in South, in South uh, Dublin. They buried them there, but they didn't find McNeil's body for un until a few weeks after the tragedy. So for that reason, he didn't. He wasn't buried with the main, uh, the the main uh, big funeral, if you like. He's buried in the grounds. He's not buried in the cathedral. He's buried in the little uh, graveyard beside the cathedral. There's a very small physical graveyard beside the cathedral, and he's buried there. And the story goes: everybody has to have a story. The story is that his his uh, dog, his pet dog, lay on top of the grave. And he refused to leave it and uh, until the dog himself died. So that's why we have a ghost in the cathedral. We have a, the, the, the only ghost we have in the cathedral is McNeil's dog. And he's he seemingly he walks around the cathedral at night. Can't guarantee that. I've never, uh, never seen him, obviously. So if you the first statue, if you walk in the door, the, uh, before you walk in the door, just in the green area in front of the cathedral, you'll see a picture of this fella. And this is a member of the Guinness family. 
he's Benjamin Lee Guinness. And he's, uh, I like to say, he's looking very, very uh, pompous looking, obviously. And he's sitting looking at a sheet of paper or a little book um, in the statue here. I like to say he's looking at the invoice because in the 1860s, the cathedral was falling to the ground practically. It had been standing at that stage for about 500, 500 600 years. It had been Protestant for about three of those, um, 300 of those years. And if you imagine the 1860s in Ireland, we were after having the Act of Union, the, the, all the, the, um, the rich people leaving Ireland. Um, then we had the famine. So the, the country was in a basket. It was in an awful state. And the cathedral was no better. The, there had been whole sections of the cathedral were unusable because the roof had fallen in and uh, it, they, they had blocked it off because they couldn't use it. So it was in a very bad state of repair, years and years of colonialism, whatever. So the whole country was in bad repair and the cathedral was no better. But uh, the Guinness factory is just up the road. And in the 1860s, it had been going, the factory itself had been going for nearly 100 years. And at this stage, it had been very successful. It was one of the richest companies in the British Isles, one of the biggest breweries in the British Isles. And um, Benjamin Lee Guinness himself was an MP sitting in the House of Commons, and uh, he loves money. So he said, I will restore the cathedral. And he was advised, you know, don't bother. There's no point in restoring this. You know, knock it down and start again. But he said, no, 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 we'll restore it. So he carried out massive works in the 1860s. He actually, he almost took the cathedral apart, if you like. He took the guts of it out, um, if you like. That's what it would have looked like pre the, ref pre the restoration. Very austere, very plain, if you like, very, very boring. And there was no seats. If you, if you look at it, this section here was no seats. The section down at the end of the church was reserved for the poor. The poor had no seats. They had to stand during the services. Uh, there was a section, the, the, the well-off people had a blocked off section up at the front, up near the choir area, and that was partitioned off because they didn't want to mix with the poor. There was down here that didn't smell so good and they had diseases. So they had, there was an actual partition between the, the choir and the rich people and the poor people down at the end. Um, the, the, uh, the, choir, the poor could hear the service, but they couldn't see it. But um, Guinness um, wiped all the, those partitions out and he opened up all of the church. He replaced all the windows. Look at that. The windows here are not stained glass. They were plain, uh, ordinary windows. And would you believe whoever built, whoever restored it, whatever company um, the uh, builders he had, they dumped every bit of the medieval glass. They didn't preserve one inch of it. It was all skipped. And then um, the, the Guinness replaced all the windows, all the all the stained glass windows in the cathedral are there since um, the Guinness restoration in the 1860s. He also replaced the floor tiles. Um, and I'll tell you about one of them when I come to it in a second. And that's that's what he stipulated. He said, I am going to build this cathedral myself. He says, we're going to do it my way or we don't do it at all. And he restored it the way he wanted. He didn't even really employ an architect. He more or less designed how it would look uh, afterwards. And there was a lot of controversy at the time. But he said, listen, we do it my way or we don't do it at all. As a, as a, as the quote, that's his quote there, that the board are pleased to entrust me unrestrictedly. In other words, I'm without interference. I'll do it my way. Now, the cost to um, Benjamin Lee, as I say, he's looking at the invoice there. The cost to him in, in that day, that in that time was £130,000. It's today the equivalent would be, I don't know how many millions to, in today's money. For instance, I was saying earlier that they replaced the roof during COVID. The roof alone cost £7 million. So that's the difference between today's prices, 7 million for the roof, 130,000 pounds for the entire cathedral 150 years ago. But that's the only that's the only um, works that have been done since then, since the Guinness restoration. The roof um, in, in 2017 was the only uh, restoration. So the, the place has, has, has stood um, itself very well. But as I was saying, they replaced all the windows and Guinness at that time, I mean, Guinness was was one of the wealthiest companies in the, in them um, in the British Isles and those guys that were so rich they thought they could do everything they you know they thought they could do what they liked I suppose they could really so when, when Guinness replaced the windows there's two windows up at the top of the church up the other side of the choir and these are in honor of his daughter Lady Anne Guinness and there's a quote from the Bible under each of the windows and Guinness were so so um uh, hard nose, but they, I mean, they were big businessmen. Like, I, I'm, I'm saying they were very altruistic, but if you think of it, they wiped out all the opposition in, in the town. Like there was the, they wiped out all the other breweries. They were hard nosed business people. They weren't, um, you know, they weren't saints. 
So, uh, but they, another thing they did was they invented marketing and advertising. And there's a quote under Lady Anne Guinness's window. She was his daughter. And of all the thousands of quotes that Guinness could, could pick, the one that they picked for the Guinness window was this. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. That's underneath um, Lady Anne Guinness's window. Imagine they were so cheeky that they picked that quote from the Bible of all the thousands that they, they could have picked. And another thing they did, I don't have a photograph. I, had, I fully intended to take a photograph today and I forgot. Um, the tiles, the floor tiles in the cathedral are all um, re re replicated of the medieval floor tiles. He, he, um, he replicated all the medieval floor tiles and replaced them during that restoration. But in doing so, he put one of the um, emblems of the Guinness coat of arms. I know we all associate the harp with Guinness, that, that's the, the drink. But of the family itself, he put um, an emblem, part of the, the Guinness coat of arms, in the floor of the cathedral. As I say, it's like putting a beer mat in the floor of the cathedral. Part of the Guinness coat of arms is a wild boar. And there's thousands of uh, tiles on the floor of the cathedral with a wild boar on them. And that, that was an advertisement. It was like Benjamin Lee said, I'm going to make sure that people in 20, 2021 remember that I'm after paying for this. And he, he literally put an advertisement for Guinness in the floor of the cathedral. They were so, so, um, I don't know, important. Now, I'm going then to I, I'm going to some of the obscure things that people wouldn't normally see on a tour uh, because they say I've been there for years and I know where the bodies are because because there's them. Um, I mentioned earlier, there's no crypts. All the bodies are buried in the walls and in the uh, in the floors. And every so often they when they, you know, they deconstruct something or they take something down or they move something, they discover um, a body in the in the wall that they didn't know was there. They find a headstone, you know, they find a, a shape of a headstone and they say, oh, there's another body. They don't actually know. They reckon there's around 400 bodies, but they don't actually know where they all are. And underneath that area, you know, remember that area, the, the north transept where the, the British flags are right underneath those in the corner. She's right in the corner is a is a. A memorial to one of the it's not really a memorial it's a headstone it's a memorial to one of the very few women in the entire cathedral and this is it here it's a headstone like i said and it's a headstone of a lady called mary st ledger and it was covered up for a long long time during some restoration over the years and for that reason it's very well preserved and all along the bottom here now you can't see it in the photograph but all along the bottom is mary's entire life story you know, the way Protestants in Ireland generally um, put their entire life story on their headstone, or they did in those days. They, uh, it, you know, it wasn't just that she was born this year and she died this year. Her entire life story is written there. And because it was covered up for hundreds of years, it's quite legible. It's quite easy to read. And Mary St. Ledger, God love her, she did nothing in her life to warrant a memorial in this nice cathedral. She just lived and died. But it's not a memorial, it's her headstone. She's actually buried in the wall behind that headstone. And Mary died at age 37. She died the same year as Queen Elizabeth I of England in 1603. She was only 37 and she died having her seventh baby. And the baby is died also, the baby's down there in the, uh, behind this memorial. But it's written here underneath her headstone. It's, it tells her life story. And Mary, God bless her, when she died at age 37, she was on her fourth husband. She's the medieval equivalent of Zsa Zsa Gabor or Liz Taylor or one of those. Um, she, she, and it lists, it, lists, it lists all the names of the husbands. And uh, she probably started out and married at 14 or 15, 16 years of age. Um, but she had four husbands. So uh, I often say she must have been really good looking to, um, to get four husbands one after the other. And one, one of the visitors uh, said, yeah, she must have been, never mind the good looking, she must have been a good shot and meaning that she shot the four husbands, but obviously she didn't. She, um, she, uh, they, they died and one after the other and um, she was able to get another husband. So she must have been particularly good looking. And again, somebody said to me, well, she must have been famous or rich or something. She wasn't. Her husband was. Her husband, her final husband, the St. Ledger husband, the, her last one, fourth one, the fellow that, that outlived her. And um, he was the uh, an Englishman sent over as master of the rolls to Ireland, which was a super job. It was a, it was a judicial job. It was something like um, a solicitor general or whatever like that. So he was master of the rolls. He was Ant Sir Anthony St. Ledger. And the funny thing was, uh, when Mary died, he remarried again, of course. 
And he absolutely hated Ireland in all his notes. He says he, he hated Ireland, but his job in ta- meant that he had to be in Ireland for a lot of the year because he was a, he had to go to the courts and, and whatnot. So he left instructions seemingly in, a, in his diaries that on, if, if he had the bad fortune to die in this godforsaken country, he was under no circumstances to be buried in it. But you have to be careful what you say, because, uh, of course, don't you know, you know, as we say in Ireland, um, what do we say? Um, uh, give God a laugh and make a plan. So he well, of course, he died in Ireland. He died down in the south of Ireland in Cork uh, in roundabout. Mary died in 1603. He died in the early 1600s. Um, it was about 10 years after her. So they had to cart his body all the way from Cork up to Dublin, cross the Irish Sea on the boat and over to London to bury him. It must have taken them about three weeks in those days. So I hope there are plenty of roses, I'm telling you. So he, he refused point blank to be buried here. So that's the, the secret of Mary in the corner. And as I say, she's the only woman in the place. I always make a point of bringing people over there because she's the only she's the only woman. So what else have I got? Oh, yeah, the choir area. This is the this is a typical layout of a Protestant church in Ireland. Uh, you would have the choir the, where the choir sit. And in the cathedral is not C-H-O-I-R, it's Q-U-I-R-E, the old English way of writing it. And then the altar is behind it. And actually, since the cathedral opened, this is a lovely photograph, I think. But since the cathedral opened after the um, the, the, uh, the roof, um, number one, it's so bright and shiny inside because they re- they took out every single window when they were re- replacing the roof for the last three years. They took out every window. They were afraid that the any um, work over them would damage them. So they're all taken out, cleaned and replaced. And the cathedral is beautiful. It's so shiny and bright inside. It's amazing the difference that um, cleaning the windows they made to it. Obviously, they could never do that um, uh, otherwise. So the the um, the choir area here. In the cathedral is used every day for even song at half past five every evening. Children from the St. Patrick's Choir School, which is right across the street, is the oldest school in Ireland. And in those days, in, when it started in the 1400s, uh, it was boys only, of course. He didn't educate girls. But boys had to um, be able to sing to get an entrance into the school. And even they even do that today. They, it's still a working school, very much a working school. They have um, both elementary, both um, primary, they call them elementary. It's a Protestant school. They have uh, elementary and they have um, secondary school. And the children are often, I often um, see the children in the, in the uh, cathedral because they come over every evening, about, about a dozen of them will come over and they'll sing uh, the service of even song um, in the cathedral they still do it today um, and it only lasts about half an hour and you can go anytime you don't have to pay in at that time, that time. it's a religious service they, they, they're there every evening during term time once the school is on they, they will be there and they'll sit in these um, chairs here along here and there's only maybe a dozen children um, you know 12 15 kids there's no microphones but you want to hear their voices because the cathedral is meant is built for music. Their voices just bounce off the ceiling and back down again. You know, it's so nice. And in the in the winter time when it's dark and cold and the kids are singing and there's nobody around, it's just like, I don't know, it's like listening to what you'd imagine the angels in heaven are. It's absolutely gorgeous. And here's a picture again um, showing an, an, another part that's on the, the same uh, part of the cathedral. You see all these flags that are flying above the um, above the choir area. They are not British flags, so nothing to do with the crown. But they are the, the flags of the Knights of Saint Patrick. And remember, I showed you the Duke of Buckingham, who was the first Grand Master. Well, the Knights. There's the close up of the flags, and these are all in the choir area. You have the flags. So these are the regimental flags of the various families of the Knights. You have their ceremonial um, helmets and swords. And then underneath here, it's like some, I say it's like a Facebook page of these guys. Down on the seats, then you'll have the family plaque, the family crest, coat of arms, and a bit about the family. And they're all real um, Protestant names. You know, they're Frederick, they're George, they're Richard. They're all real uh, Protestant names. And obviously, you had to be a man. And you had, for a long time, you had to be a Protestant to be a Knight of St. Patrick. And there's no more of them now. They're all, uh, they have been disbanded. They did have their inauguration ceremonies here in the cathedral for a long time. And here's a picture. That's the same area. That's almost the same um, area that you're looking at here, the, the choir area as it is today. And here's a picture of the inauguration. This is in the 1868. And one of these nice ladies here is Queen Victoria. And possibly that one there. She's surrounded by our ladies in waiting. And she's here to attend the inauguration of her son, the Prince of Wales, into the Knights of St. Patrick. 
So we, we don't think that any of these fancy ceremonies happened in Ireland, but there's one that did in the, in the cathedral itself. Now, how, much, how am I doing in time? Oh, nearly done. Oh, yeah, the organ stairs. Again, that's tucked into the corner. And it's right over near where those British flags were, the, the old uh, British Army flags, um, near where St. Mary St. Ledger is. Um, it's a lovely, beautiful marble carved staircase. And it's, it, it goes up almost like Rapunzel, you know, the fairy story. Um, it, it, it's, it's a winding staircase and it goes up to the organ loft. And it's my abiding wish to get uh, to go up those stairs. I've never been. I have to ask if someday can I go up those stairs? I'd love to go up. Actually, today um, the door was open and there was somebody walking up up the stairs today. They were going up to play the organ, and it's used twice a day for the organ master to go up to the organ loft to play the organ there. And this is a lovely photograph taken from the organ loft. This is where the organ is at the top of the um, the church, way up on the roof, uh, you know, the roof space. And it's looking down on the um, on there, the flags of the Knights of St. Patrick. And I was mentioning the acoustics in the cathedral because one day oh, a couple of years ago, several years ago, five or six years ago, I was down at ground level, obviously, and I was leading a big tour and the place was very busy. I had to shout. And there was somebody I could see a figure up in the up in the organ loft. And I said, oh, look, there's a man up there playing the organ. And the man turned around and I said, I'm not a man, I'm a woman. So she could hear me and I could hear her. And she must have been 40, 50 feet up in the air. So the, the acoustics are fabulous. Something else, really, really something else. I love that photograph when you're looking down on the ground there. Nearly done. Oh, here's our um, our, our high hitter, our, our top, our number one um, high hitter in the cathedral. And this, of course, is Jonathan Swift. And he was Dean of St. Patrick in the from 1713 to 1745 until his death in uh, 1745. And Swift had an amazing um, life story because he was um, he always when he became famous and he became well known, he put out the story that his father had died before a few months before he was born which was a time-honoured tradition in those days. Swift was born in Dublin in the 1660s. And that was a time-honoured tradition of hiding an illegitimate birth. Um, illegitimacy had such a, a stigma attached to it, and Swift didn't want people to know that he was illegitimate. But I, I would imagine he was. His father was supposed to have died just before he was born. And his mother more or less abandoned him. The story, again, he put out the story that his nursemaid had uh, run away with him and kidnapped him. Now, that, no, I, I doubt if that ever happened. But Swift was technically abandoned as an infant. So in those days, any infant life was tough, but uh, certainly an abandoned one hadn't a hope in hell. So, but somebody was looking out for Swift. Um, he was educated. He, he actually ended up in Trinity College. He, had, he went to Trinity about around about the age of 14. And uh, one of his reports cards, one of his tutors said he, uh, he was a frequenter of taverns. So he was fond of the drink. Uh, he went, um, he was obviously a Protestant. He went over to England for a while and he was the um, private secretary for a man called Sir William Temple, him of the Temple Bar family, same family as, as the, whoever owned that area where te present day Temple Bar is. So he was a private secretary of, of Sir William Temple. And one, one of his duties in the house in England uh, was that he would also um, be a private tutor to a young child living in the house. And her name was Esther. And Esther was the daughter of one of the servants in the house. So she was quite likely illegitimate also. But uh, he was asked to, to be our private tutor. So he was he came back to Ireland. He got he was um, eventually came back to Ireland. He was the, he was a priest, a clergyman in various parishes in, in uh, Ireland. And eventually he got um, the, the dean of uh, St. Patrick's in 1713. And he also got a grace and favour house. The deanery, there's a house goes with a job. It's, around, it's still there. It's around the corner uh, from the cathedral. And he was living in that house. And while he was there, he was there, there for a few years when that child, that little girl that he knew in England, she was about 20 years younger than him. She followed him over to Ireland. At this stage, she was a young lady, a young woman. She came over to Ireland and she moved into the house with Swift, with a chaperone. And they say now there was no news of the world, no Irish Times. Nobody really knows. But they say, according to his papers, they lived together for the next 20 years in that house himself. And uh, he called her Stella. His nickname for her was Stella. Her real name was Esther. And they lived together like brother and sister, always with a chaperone. And they never married. He could, he could have married. He was a Protestant clergyman, but he never married. Swift never married anybody. He had no children. But um, they lived together as a brother and sister because it's quite likely that's what they were. They were actually half brother and sister because the temple, that uh, Sir William Temple, might have been the, their common father. 
Now, again, nobody knows. They're not really sure. But Stella died, although she was years younger than him, she died about 20 years before he did. She died in, in uh, the late uh, the late 1720s. And uh, Swift was so devastated when she died that he couldn't attend her funeral. Even though he was the head guy there, he never attended her funeral. And they're both buried in the floor of the cathedral. Now, we did have another lady friend. He had her out. Her, her name was Vanessa. And she was parked out in Selbridge. And he used to visit her on a regular basis every Saturday night or whatever. So um, and because there was no Irish Times or no news of the world, he was able to keep the two women um, apart from each other all those years. Although they say that they eventually did find out about each other. But uh, Swift is buried with Stella, the lady who shared the house with him, and they're buried on the floor of the cathedral. Swift was very acerbic. He was very, very sarcastic. You wouldn't want to burn his dinner, as I say. He would have, he was, he could actually absolutely skin you with his tongue. He was very, very, uh, he didn't suffer fools gladly, but he was a big hero. And uh, he was a big hero of the area, a big champion of the Irish people. He was like a Bono, I suppose, although I, I don't like Bono particularly, but he was he was always um, fighting against how badly treated the Irish were in their own country. He was a big, big champion of the Irish people. And that's why he wrote Gulliver's Travels. Um, that's, we give that to kids to read, but it's actually um, a, sarcast, a sarcastic book uh, complaining about how badly treated the Irish were. And he also wrote a little book, but there's a copy of it in the cathedral. It's called A Modest Proposal. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but um, Swift at that time in the early 1700s, the biggest problem in Ireland um, was overpopulation and hunger. Uh, the, the general Irish people, there was over too many of us and we were starving. So Swift reckoned he won, He wrote that his proposal to alleviate both of those problems would be to cook and eat children. Right now, let that sink in. I always tell visitors we never got that bad. We never had to eat children, believe me. But um, Swift wrote this book. His proposal, his modest proposal um, was that and that he wrote this book the way a farmer today would talk about how you would rear cattle and sheep. He, he talked about how you would rear children for the pay, table to make money. And he did it solely to embarrass England in the eyes of the world. England was running half of the known world at the time. They had colonies from America to Australia. And he wanted to embarrass them by saying that their, their nearest neighbour, the people that they've been colonising for hundreds of years, they have to eat their children. So uh, his proposal was that um, you didn't eat the little girls. You needed the girls for breeding. That you only had the little boys around about the age of two. They were nice and plump and tender. And he went on and on about the hair and the teeth, which I won't go into. But it, it caused massive embarrassment in England when it was published and worked. Uh, it, it, um, it did alleviate some of the poverty. Not all of it, of course, but some of it. He's buried in the floor of the cathedral. Um, and Estella, that's Esther, is right beside him. And because of the uh, the um, the floods, the, the, their coffins were disinterred about 100 years after he died. He died in, in uh, 1745. About 100 years after his death, they, both the coffins floated to the top and they had to move them. And uh, they took his, his skull. At that stage, he was 100 years dead. They took his skull and it was examined by none other than Oscar Wilde's father. You know, um, William Wilde was a surgeon. And he examined his skull, Swift's skull, and he discovered that he had suffered from many years disease. And many years disease is still going today. It's a disease of the ear, the inner ear, the bones in the ear. And it causes you to be um, dizzy and to hear ringing in your ear. And uh, Swift had it all his life. You're born with it. It wouldn't kill you. But um, as he got older, Swift, Swift lived to be the ripe old age of 70 something, I think. Um, uh, he, um, as he as he got older, the many years got an awful lot worse and he thought he was going mad. He was beginning. He, he did. He, he eventually went senile. Um, but he thought he was going mad. And in those days, people suffering from mental disorders were treated very badly. And that's why he left all his money. Swift would have died relatively wealthy. And um, he left all his money to found St. Patrick's Hospital. Um, to uh, to found um, the hospital still going today for people suffering from um, from those disorders. And he, he even wrote his own epitaph. He didn't trust anyone to uh, to write an epitaph for him. So he wrote that before, obviously, before he died. And this is what he wrote about St. Patrick's. He actually wrote these words about St. Patrick's Cathedral. He gave the little wealth he had to build a house for fools and mad and showed by one satiric touch no nation needed it so much. So Swift reckoned the Irish were all mad. He was probably, he was probably right. But um, I found out later that when they reinterred the two bodies, that they put them in the same box. So Stella and Swift are in the same box after sharing their life together in the house. So I think I'm nearly done. Nearly a... Uh, yeah. Oh, there's a lovely picture. That's my one of my favorite. I have a random, a couple of random uh, photographs to show you now. That's a picture of uh, Patrick Street looking down at the cathedral. 
in the in the mist there from all the smoky fires that would have been there. And again, that picture was taken, I'd say, in the um, pre the Ivy buildings. They're not the Ivy buildings; they're the old tenements. And you can see the old uh, huts along here, the old market. So that would have been around the 1840s or 50s. Um, and the the clock, that tower actually went on and it went, went up only in the 1500s, the tower of the, of the cathedral that you can see. And the clock was the only, it uh, was one of the first um, public clocks in Dublin. So if you want to know the time, you had to walk all the way down to Patrick Street. And these are some pictures that I got from the cathedral office when they were doing the works on the roof. They um they sent me these pictures. And if you look at those tiles, they're the, the original stone tiles that um Guinness put up. They're made of stone, so they didn't break, but they um they were fixed with iron fixings and the iron nails all dis rusted and disintegrated, and the, the tiles started to slide down the roof. So they um they were able to preserve, reuse most of the tiles, uh, but at the same time, it still cost them seven million to fix them. And hopefully they didn't they use stainless steel nails this time. And I love this photograph of this guy. Look, he has his COVID mask on and he's obviously refilling the old the old um, masonry from the outside. It looks like he's using a nail file. The poor guy is probably still up there doing it. Imagine all the acres and acres of, of, uh, of um, masonry that he had, to, he had to fix. I hope he had somebody else helping him out. And there's another um, picture of the uh, again of the roof. So it was a, a massive big job. And as I say, it took them about two years and it cost us seven million. So that's all my story, I think, of everything. Yeah, I think that's the end of the month. It is. Oh yeah, there's something that they've had. That's this is my end one. When they were doing the roof last a couple last, a couple of years ago, again they found these gargoyles. They had been covered up under some restoration over the years, and they found them. And they were up on the roof, on the outside of the roof. But they had the fact that they've been covered up. They are they're still in good nick. They're um they're gargoyles, and there are two lion lions or or um, wolves. I'm not sure what they are. Dragons and are fighting, and they're um, uh, on the roof. They didn't know they were there. So that's that's all I have to say. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> I'll stop the share. Well, thank you so much for that Another brilliant talk. talk. I am going to unmute everybody and uh, take questions. Okay. Well, I, I hope you're all to... still awake. Yeah. <laughs> all I have to do is... With you. I have to say the cathedral are very welcoming. Okay, I've just uh, clicked the button to enable everybody to unmute themselves. So if you would be so kind and if we can express our appreciation for Jer's talk and ask questions. Uh, you, you're welcome to ask the question yourself or if you put it in the chat, I'll ask on your behalf, totally up to you. Geraldine, can I just say thank you very, very much. I really, really enjoyed it. Not all. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. But would all. you know, would you know offhand, Benjamin Lee Guinness, would he have been Arthur Guinness's grandson? His grandson, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's either a son, I think he's his grandson. He was the father of um, was he his grandson or the son? I think it was it might have been a son. He was the father of uh, Lord Ivy, who built the flats, who built the apartments. And Lord Ivy was the one then who built the built Ivy flats, yeah, the Ivy buildings. Yeah, he was uh, Benjamin Lee was the father of um, Lord Ivy and Lord Ordelon, who did the um, the St Stephen's Green. Mm -hmm. I think he was Arthur Guinness's son. Would he have been 1750, 18? No, he might have been his grandson, probably two generations away. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. I was thinking. He was a... Now, we did a wonderful tour that Mary organized in County Kildare in our cloth because there's an art oh, that's right. exhibition. Oh, it was wonderful. And we had the added bonus of seeing where he was buried. Oh, that's right. He's buried in Selbridge. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> really enjoyable. Thank Did you. Did that talk go into oh, Vanessa and Swift? Yeah. We, we, we have a question from Mary Gormley, who wants to know who paid the 7 million euro to repair the roof. Oh, it was um, by uh, the well, the government paid something. They gave a donation, and the rest of it then is just from donations. Or they're still looking for money. You can you can go in there in the morning and give a donation with a credit card. They you tap a little machine on the wall. Yeah, they they, they got it from public donations, and from uh, I know the government did give them a grant, and they 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 they're still paying for it. I'd say they'll be paying for it for a long time. They they have a very small congregation, even though it's the biggest church in Ireland. There wouldn't be a hundred people there on a Sunday at the services. So um a uh, very, very small dwindling pop, um, congregation. 
So what, what, what's the deal at the moment, Geraldine, with regard to restrictions? You, you can go into the services without making free arrangements? Or... Yeah, you can do, yeah, yeah. Again, they, they don't have a lot of people. Yeah, they're, they're, I think it's restricted to about 200. Now that's all stopping in October, the end of October. Uh, at the moment, um, they, they, yeah, they will let you in at any time because it's so big. You know, um, now they're, they're stuck. As far as I know, they, they're not, they haven't restarted. They volunteer. They used to have a, two guided tours every day by volunteers like myself they're, they're not doing them they haven't restarted them they have audio guides those awful audio guides but um like they're very they've done their best for them but all you're getting is facts you know you're not getting the stories so which which i think you miss but uh that's the way you go, i guess it goes uh, i don't know they, i'm not sure if they'll ever do guided tours again oh dear that's very yeah. Isn't it? yeah. So I've lost my volunteer job. I can't even work for nothing these days. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyone else with a question? Yeah. I must um, organize a tour actually. Maybe when they put up some of the Christmas decorations, maybe in December, we'll organize them an in person tour. That would be Again, great. it'll only be what, I'm, what you're after looking at already, but maybe you'd like to see them anyway. I might do that, yeah. Well, I, I think I know certainly that going in there now, having seen the, the monuments and statues that you chose to present today, I know so much more depth, have, have so much more in-depth information about them. It would make it a much uh, more meaningful experience. I hope I didn't talk too fast. I generally talk too fast when <laughs> talking on these things. <laughs> We have a lot of things coming in the chat. People who are saying how great the talk was and how much they enjoyed it, uh, quite quite rightfully. Yes. While, while people are thinking of more questions, I just want to say we would be very interested in hearing from anybody in our group about giving one of these talks. And it could certainly be something you've given already because we've only just started recording them recently or you might want to revisit and revise. So uh, please get in touch with me or Geraldine if, if you're interested. Uh, the people who gave talks on the bridges, for example, you could take, say, you know, if you gave three, if you did three bridges on three separate days, uh, you could combine the three and give a talk on, on those three bridges, say, just as, a, as an example. Uh, so we'd be very interested in hearing from you. Yeah, myself and Beverly would like to record um, the talks because there yeah. were so many fabulous talks last winter and unfortunately a lot of them weren't recorded. So um, that's why we're repeating some of them. So if anybody did do um, a talk, um, you're very welcome to repeat it. Like the, a lot, they nearly all bear repeating. They were so good. There were some of the talks were brilliant, especially the ones on the bridges. And if, even if you haven't heard them already, um, uh, you know, they're worthwhile um, listening to them again. So we, we'd really welcome um, various uh, volunteers. And we'll give oh, you we any help that you need with the technology or whatever. We will, absolutely, yes. <laughs> we have a, a, an interesting question uh, from MJ. Did the Boyle family die out in Ireland? Did they, they die out? They did, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Their, their pile, uh, their family home is Lismore Castle and then go down in Waterford, Cork area. So you can visit that. It's actually a lovely place to visit. Yeah, it's good. They're gone. Yeah, the family is more or less gone. Yeah, it's like the Guinnesses, I guess, they're gone too, more or less. Yeah. Now, R Rushin was telling us before the talk began about a Handel music night in St. Patrick's Cathedral, and she's very kindly provided the date and time. It's 17th of December at 7.30, and there's a cost, but as she says, it could help towards the, to pay for the roof. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we could organize a small group of ourselves to go uh, as an informal uh, meetup activity, if anyone's interested. You could always contact any of us, me or Geraldine or each other, you know, by sending a message through the meetup site. Mm -hmm. We're all reachable by messages on that site. If you do that, then we'll answer with our private email addresses and we could carry on a conversation. Yes, she said she did send Anybody else with a question or a comment? 
Well, then we, we can stop on and chat for a bit. I'm going to stop the recording at this point. And as I say, we're quite welcome to stop on and have a chat. <laughs>